Yeah, so fintech is a lexicon that is used quite a lot, like you said. I think fintech means different things to different people depending on the markets you operate in, the customers you serve, and and the problems you're trying to solve. For us, the way I like to think about fintech is fintech business is primarily a business that is a technology first driven business. Fintechs of this generation really unleash their power by marrying both AI technology and data to deliver services or fulfill a market gap using financial services or financial product. The center of gravity really starts from having fundamentally the DNA being a technology uh, company to think about solving customer problems that are out there, market gap that is unfulfilled and financial services, if you like, financial products being the tools to achieve that. If you think about Asiata's fintech journey, I mean, our whole right to play in this space started because we um, operate in markets where there is a fundamental market failure or there is a market gap created where traditional financial institutions have not been able um, to fulfill uh, or serve certain segments of the market, most notably underserved segments or segments at the bottom of the pyramid across most of our markets in South Asia, Southeast Asia. And that was really the fundamental reason why we got into this space because we felt we had a fundamental right to play. If you take our telco heritage, we primarily serve customers in that strata of the socioeconomic pyramid. So we serve a lot of customers, the postpaid customers, customers that traditionally are not banked or underserved by financial institutions. We also, being a mobile company, had access mediums to these uh, sets of customers that other companies perhaps didn't have, so we understood them. And thereby, we felt that we had a fundamental right to play uh, serving this set of customers using technology fu fundamentally as uh, the tool to solve that pain point. And that really was the genesis of our fintech journey. And it's a journey that started almost four years ago, focused initially on markets in Malaysia and Indonesia, some of our other markets as well. Um, but the initial hypothesis that we had that uh, there are underserved segments in the markets we serve, that there is an opportunity to serve and that we can provide that service, I would like to think has been validated, right? So that, that really, uh, when we think about a fintech in the markets we operate in, we really look at ourselves as, um, you know, serving the underserved, serving uh, segments of society that are not served using technology, marrying or unleashing the potential of technology, data and AI. And I can talk a bit more about that. And that's really bread and butter of our business and financial services products by which we fulfill those needs. But that is not the center of gravity of our business. So if you take my first decade in working in financial services, uh, we, we were serving very, so I, I cut across, you know, investment management, investment banking. We were really serving a small, uh, what, 5% of the population of our markets, right? We're talking about large enterprises, medium-sized enterprises. We're talking about high net worth clients um, and so forth, right? So it was really more the bread and butter vanilla products that would go out to a lower tiers of people. And and, and uh, these are markets in the West. If, if you take uh, the markets that we operate in here, you know, the, the, the distinction is even more stark. So very early on, it was all, I mean, in my whole time in working in the traditional FI sector, it was very clear to me that um, uh, we were not serving all needs at scale across markets, right? So there was an opportunity to serve. Now, for a traditional FI, the, bar the barrier is often the fact that the cost to serve um, people at that level of or businesses at the lower, uh, lower, lower strata is not always that economical, right? Because if you think about a traditional bank, for instance, the cost of setting up a bank branch, you dishing out, let's say, $100 loans, is not something that you can do profitably using a traditional brick and mortar setup, right? Now, that's where technology really changed the game, and especially digital technology. One is the proliferation of mobile devices, right? The rise of the smartphone and the ability to deliver a lot of products, financial products and services on platforms that were not there previously, right? That kind of opened up a whole avenue for us to reach these customers at scale at a positive unit economic value. And that's not that's not possible for traditional FIs. So that really, I think, was the game change. And that came really in the 2010s, right? The last 10 to 12 or maybe 14, 15 years, right? And that was the that was the opportunity uh, that, that a lot of fintech companies have embraced. That's really um, what a lot of us are trying to achieve in this space, especially in markets in South Asia, Southeast Asia. 
Well, I think the biggest trend that none of us saw coming was COVID, and that has really shifted the industry. Now, positive, it, it's posed challenges, uh, but it has also accelerated certain aspects of digital adoption in fintech. So it has obviously given um, a, a jump start to people in the broader tech uh, space as a whole, right? Allow people to re- uh, driven digital adoption across markets that were traditionally underpenetrated. But that has also, we've also seen that really uh, proliferate in the fintech space. If you take a lot of fintech companies, if you take uh, what we've done in at Boost, for example, if I take just our wallet business, going into the pandemic in Malaysia, where digital adoption is, you know, really quite high, we had 70% of our transactions uh, really coming from offline use cases. Now, fast forward 12 months down the line, we have about 70% of our transactions now coming from online use cases. So that structural shift has happened for a lot of fintechs and investors that are really putting money behind it. If you take the money that has flown to tech companies in general over the last three quarters, it's been about 4x the amount it was in the previous five years or the annual if you, if you normally i mean you take the annual amounts right if you take or, or look at it on a quarterly basis so i think the last quarter we had something like 156 billion dollars flowing into tech uh, investors putting money into tech globally about 40 percent of the money went into the fintech space right so it's brought in a whole new category of investors as well people i mean categories of investors like hedge funds that would never think of investing in early stage companies, in the private markets. Uh, and I used to work in that space. So 10 years ago, nobody would look at that space. Now we've had a whole host of investors coming in. So we have capital flows. Uh, so we, we've got adoption in our base uh, services in FinTech. We have capital flows supporting that. And you have a lot of business models now getting funded different types of business models getting funded across the uh, fintech space, uh, whether it be insure tech, whether it is cross-border services, whether it is um, banking, open open banking services, uh, alternative credit lending. There's a lot of uh, models that are getting funded now. And I think there's a huge opportunity for a lot of fintechs in the space. And I think that is not something when we started four years ago, uh, the rate of adoption that we've seen uh, the, uh, the 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 investor interest behind this sector is not something we would have seen four years ago. Now, COVID did accelerate all all of this, but the trend was always there. It was always an area that was growing. It was always an area where, that was getting increasing investor in, interest. I think um, it's just that maybe we've leapfrogged maybe one or two years or maybe a couple of quarters because of what has happened uh, with COVID. So the big broad themes that I see now are, I would say in a, in a couple of buckets, right? So a lot of fintechs are looking at an inclusive model, not just in terms of the customers they serve, but who they're partners. So embedded fintech products is a big theme now. What I mean by that is uh, fintech companies, whether you're an insure tech company or whether you're a lending company, lending products is a big theme right now in fintech where those products are embedded uh, in the customer journeys and the purchasing journeys of other companies that are completely not in fintech. So it could be an e-commerce company, it could be a grocery store, et cetera, right? And this is not about distribution or cross-selling, it's really embedded and it's part of the transaction cycle of somebody else. So for example, buy now, pay later, which is quite popular, is one manifestation of that, which is basically um, a a way of providing uh, installment credit uh, to people who traditionally don't have any credit profile uh, when they buy something on e-commerce store, for instance or when they go and buy something, you know, at a, at a, at a retail store, electronic retail store. So uh, these embedded products are something that is fast gaining traction. And it's a model that um, whether it be lending, uh, digital lending, insure tech, etc. I think that will continue to accelerate because the partnership driven model is important to also unleash the power of understanding your customer and understanding the data that you can collect behind customers. So I think that that's one. Then you have broad themes like open banking, which is getting um, something unheard of five years ago where banks are now opening up their tech stacks via APIs where um, a traditional bank would be able to now cross sell other products, give people access to somebody's bank account, obviously with consent, but be able to cross sell and sell products, right? That has given rise to something that has got quite topical now, which is the rise of the standalone digital banks or challenger banks, which is also getting uh, quite topical. And I think it's going to come to a point where we see a lot of fintechs now evolving their models and cutting across the spectrum of services they provide, right? So if you think about us, we started off probably in payments, we got into digital lending, and now I think in Malaysia, we are looking to, you know, fold some of these services into a digital bank. If you think about traditional FIs, 
they are probably trying to um you know digitize they are at least a custom interface and some banks have done that more successfully than others but it started with almost plain vanilla or 101 kind of steps where you digitize your custom interface or your service interface as touch points but now it's gone to that whole area of open banking where you partner with tech companies and allow tech companies to really access a whole host of APIs across a traditional bank so i see i see if i think about it 5 years out i think the lines blurring what a traditional fi looks like and what a fintech player looks like i think uh, there is opportunity for fintechs to really grow in our markets i think in terms of segments they serve i think fintechs would continue to serve primarily uh, unserved segments but i think the range of services and the license that says under which they operate would change so a lot of serious players would come more under the regulatory umbrella right now a lot of them strike and stay at the periphery so for instance us getting a digital banking license we are coming more under the regulatory um umbrella or, uh, but at the same time we are able to add a lot more value and also extract a lot more value from the services that we provide uh, under that kind of a model so that's i think some the evolution that you would see um with a lot of serious uh, uh, players coming in fintech of course is a very different business or very different uh, business to other tech businesses because being primarily selling or 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 productizing financial services products you are regulated in most markets how you deal with regulators um as you gain scale you will find more and more fintechs coming in under a regulatory umbrella and also thereby maybe even overlapping in some of the services and segments that they play in with the traditional fis as well well more than technologies i can i, I would play on a couple of uh, models of products right so i think one fintech um business that has kind of kind of gone under the radar that i think has a lot of uh, potential is digital wealth management and digital investments while a lot of fintech players have been trying to focus on providing access uh, to customers or, or uh, access to credit or um, providing them platforms for cashless transactions I think in a lot of our markets there is also a dire need to get people uh, more educated on the need for savings. So if you take Malaysia for instance, um, I think the household GDP uh, household debt to GDP is almost 70%. So there is the, in a lot of economies in this part of the world the need to build or solve the problem of getting people uh, into the saving mentality from a very young age is very much there. I think fintech also has a role to play there. If you think about um, the models that are out there right now there are some very interesting models if you think about digital wealth management some of it is getting into robo advisory i think that's probably an area that i think will grow over the next 5 years i think that will have a lot of focus um, i think because it's solving a real problem and right now it's not really getting the capital flows behind it the other one i guess is like i mentioned i think um you will probably have digital standalone digital banks uh, five years down the line you, you won't have a lot of players there because i think uh, the, the the right to play there uh, is a lot more uh, constrained but you would probably see one or two very successful standalone digital only banks that are operating at scale uh, in some markets right because i think that's the natural progression for a lot of fintechs playing on the periphery today and i think a uh, few of them have um, what it takes to succeed and i think that if you think think about uh, you know this 5 years forward i think those are two models that uh, would be very successful and would be operating um, across markets at scale at uh, very um, exorbitant valuations Yeah I think um a lot of fintechs are focused on the B2C space and I think there are a couple of interesting B2B models that could really uh, gain uh, traction here as well so one of it is um you know a model that serves small businesses small merchants providing a whole host of uh, fintech services whether it is payroll services whether it is um simple things like you know your accounting services ability to transact credit insurance protection all bundled into a single kind of an app Uh, interface right so small business enterprise solutions is something that isn't something that is pervasive here right now i think if you look at what has happened again with covid and if you look at the focus by a lot of policy makers also to try and help small businesses digitize and cross that divide 
uh, and get into uh, the digital world where a lot of their transactions happen on digital platforms i think that's something that will gain more traction i think there is an opportunity for fintech players to seriously look at that i think some players have kind kind of touched the periphery around that but haven't gone really in depth i think there's a lot to be done on large enterprise solutions as well uh, when it comes to areas like fraud and security services which is getting increasingly more cognizant about the need to invest in such platforms so i think fintechs so while there are very large traditional enterprise solutions that provide you some of these services i see a lot of fintechs for instance using blockchain technology to do fraud management to do reconciliation and audit so that's another area i think that fintechs are and those are some models that are just coming out in some parts of the world that i think have legs in our part of the world as well Well, if you think about it, blockchain does have a globally recognized use case. If you take the, all the all the cryptocurrency exchanges are essentially using blockchain, so I think those use cases have somewhat been established. I think there are new areas, obviously, that are using blockchain technology. I think digital identity is one. So the use of you know your digital avatar and replicating that using a distributed ledger on uh, the back of blockchain technology is something people are looking at as an alternative for eKYC. again blockchain in security applications like i said we are just scratching the surface there the use of blockchain in um on capital markets for real time settlement not, not just in terms of the cryptocurrency trading that we think about but in terms of you know seamless uh, trading settlements and reconciliations in that getting a lot of legs as well so i think i think blockchain fundamentally as a technology has a lot of applications i think it's used getting more and more pervasive i think the ones i mentioned are the ones that i currently see a lot of adoption happening especially digital identity is um something that is becoming increasingly important the use of uh, you know ekyc has now become almost mainstream across a lot of financial institutions in this part of the world the need to uh, become better at how we digitally know your customer is always uh, something that regulators are looking at so i think the uh, the use of blockchain technology there has just started scratching the surface so i think that's something that we want to watch so i can take the example of how we use ai in our uh, lending business today right so for example so if you take what we have in our lending business which we built about 4 years ago uh, in asiata today a small business uh, can get a loan from asiata um, from boost credit which is the brand that we use in under 3 minutes it's a digital application journey where based on the data that we have about the applicant our ai um, algorithms are able to really score the customer in under 3 minutes and assess the customer and then provide a loan to the customer which is then dispersed in 24 hours so if we were to think about how that experience happens in a traditional fi or you have that experience devoid of ai you would not be able to um serve a large number of customers at that speed at the level of accuracy uh in terms of uh, getting the credit underwriting quality that you want so if you take malaysia today we've um, distributed almost 400 million bring it worth of loans under this model npl non performing loan rate which is a measure of asset quality has been under 3% like i said we're able to process these loans in minutes that has essentially replaced the traditional credit underwriting process which would require you to given given your income documents you know have somebody review them um, do traditional credit underwriting that's how one example in uh, a real life example uh, in asiata of how we used ai to really scale something where we've been able to a reach a set of customers that uh, we would not otherwise have been able to reach b been able to process it uh, at at breakneck speed and three been able to serve you know uh, tens of thousands of customers in a very short space of time right so that's that's just one example of how the uh, how we're unleashing the power of ai to help us do what we want to do i think um okay so a couple of things i think the structure of markets is important if you think about uh, digital uh, businesses in general of fintech businesses especially if you think about the payment space um there are really no barriers to entry right so so if if you think about um digital and if you think about fintech companies there's a lot of value creation that happens to the customer but uh, the value capture component is quite difficult so how much of the value is captured by the companies over a long period of time uh, is always a challenge for companies in industries where there is no moat so i think i think one is uh, if you take the payment landscape for instance if you have highly competitive market where a lot of players uh, do throw in a lot of cash and support non economic models that are not economically viable then it becomes difficult for everybody in the industry so some amount of market structure is important so we have we have kind of orderly competition i think that's a basic one 
I think the other one is it's important to have uh, constant regulatory engagement, right? So, I mean, we've seen in China uh, now where some of the big fintech companies over there get into um, some hot water with the regulators. As you grow as, as a fintech, as you provide services to many parts, many segments of society, it's important that also that you take the regulators along with you and that investment in educating uh, the regulators is, uh, is super important. And I think if you don't invest in that, that's when a regu- a regulation becomes a bottleneck. So having an enabling regulatory environment is necessary. If it's not, it becomes an obstacle. I think that's not really on the regulator, that's also on the market participants. So um, I think those are the two very, very important uh, items for any fintech industry uh, to thrive. And then also you, you need to have the right capital flows backing the models. What I mean by that is you need to have investors who understand this business models of fintechs or for that matter a lot of tech companies and have the investment mandate and the understanding to um, realize shareholder returns uh, based on what those models provide. That is getting increasingly solved given the fact that we have a whole host of different kinds of investors coming into this space earlier. If you're a fintech company, if you're a startup, you have a few places you go to for investment, right? And that limits the scale to which you can grow your model. Now, capital flows into this sector are quite broad-based and that really helps. So so traditionally, that had been an obstacle for a lot of uh, really, really good business models to scale. I think that problem is getting solved to a large extent. What we did recently was consolidated all our fintech assets um, under one holding company and we rebranded it boost across, right? So earlier we operated in different, under different brands um, in, in, in uh, different markets. We did a consolidation exercise where we branded everything as, I mean, the brand of boost is known primarily as an e-wallet in Malaysia. As part of what we did in terms of the consolidation exercise, it gave us an opportunity to make, uh, to really recast the brand and make it stand for a lot more than just uh, payment services or e-wallet services in Malaysia. So if you look at what is under the Boost brand today, um, you have, um, yes, the original uh, uh, payment business. You have a merchant business that has been incubated out uh, separately, which we call Boost Biz, which is a a separate uh, business that provides uh, solutions to small merchants uh, to help them digitize. You have an alternative credit business in both Malaysia and Indonesia uh, called Boost Credit that will, uh, in Malaysia at least, will eventually uh, lay the foundation for the digital bank if and when we get the license. You have Boost Connect, which uh, provides enterprise cross-border payment solutions across seven markets. Uh, You have Boost Insure, which is an insure tech business. So, so, So what we serve today, let alone what we will serve in the future under the Boost umbrella, is much more than payment services, right? And I think uh, that's that's one that's that gives you an indication of where we want to take uh, the brand and the spaces we want to uh, to play in. Right now, we operate primarily in Malaysia and Indonesia. The real ambition is to take the Boost brand regional across other markets. We will probably um, look at it on a case by case basis. So as much as uh, fintech is business model that can be replicated across different markets. It's also a very local business, uh, local regulation, lo- local market context. We will look to take the Boost brand beyond the shores of Malaysia and beyond the markets that we play in today. In terms of the business lines that we focus on, I think it's it's pretty much what I mentioned. And I think um, we will look to really double down on some of those areas. So Hong Kong came out with it first uh, in this part of the world, then Singapore and then Malaysia followed, right? So I think there's been a learning process as you've gone along. Each regulator has learned from some of what the uh, regulator who came out previously did. Uh, Hong Kong basically came out with a license that was very similar to what a traditional bank uh, license. I think almost an exact replica of what you would need to operate if you were a traditional bank, but it just allowed you to do it uh, branchless, right? Without having the need to have a physical presence. Uh, Singapore took an approach that um, was slightly different because the the licenses in Singapore are really to support the objective of making Singapore a financial hub. There isn't really an underserved segment if you think about it in Singapore, right? So the license was catered a little bit to that. But again, it had the the tiered approach. In Malaysia, um, the license had a very specific objective and it was articulated quite clearly that it is the the, the business models or the applicants need to be able to um, demonstrate how their business model would serve underserved segments, right? So each of the licenses had different, different objectives uh, depending on the markets that they operated in. Generally, I think they were um, progressive in terms of, you know, generating interest and supporting models that met the requirements of those markets. So Singapore's market is to, you know, enhance its position as a financial hub in Malaysia. 
Asia, it was really to solve um, the, uh, a large segments of underserved businesses and customers that are out there uh, and so forth, right? So I think from that perspective, the regulator uh, licensing frameworks were progressive. Uh, certainly uh, in the context of Malaysia, I would say it's, it was very progressive. But the jury is still out there, right? Because um, I think in Hong Kong, you know, the, the, the models have just started. I mean, the, the banks have just uh, started operating. We would expect the Singapore banks to probably start operating maybe in the next year or so. And Malaysia will know probably sometime next year. So it's a journey, you know. So one is awarding the licenses and the framework you come out with. But then it's also how you interact with the players who have got the license, right? So I think the jury is still out there on that one. But I think in terms of regulatory intent, most regulators were looking at this uh, in the right way. I think the value proposition that uh, each party to our consortium brings is quite yeah. So um, Boost, if you like, is the party that has uh, been a trailblazer in Malaysia on the, in the fintech space, right? So we bring in the expertise around fintech, around the, being able to use technology and AI to serve underserved segments. We've already built a fairly large customer base in that space. At the same time, we'll be the first to admit that we don't have an expertise in how to run a bank, right? So there are areas, especially when it comes to risk, compliance, capital management, that require a high threshold to what we are experiencing, right? So um, that is the element that we're looking at tradition, uh, for a traditional bank to come in and, and, and help us with. So if you think about a lot of where we would focus our resources and effort, it would be really on uh, the, uh, keep making sure the bank operates, continues to operate as a fintech and focuses a lot on enhancing the value proposition that we already have, the products and services we already have it's, uh, in terms of serving underserved customers. RHB would help us build that banking infrastructure and how we've constructed our fintech today. So I think that's kind of what each party uh, brings to the table. I think also it's important that um, there's an alignment of purpose and principle. And with RHP, it was not a shotgun marriage. We um, were in discussions with them for almost two years prior to putting the application in together. So we were able to align our first principles very, very clearly. And I think that's important in any partnership. And uh, what each party brings to the table is quite clear. The roles each party plays is quite clear and the expectations from the two uh, the two consortium partners from the JV is also quite clear. So I think that uh, that, that alignment of uh, principles is also something that's very important and we were able to cross that bridge very, very early on with RHP. I would say one is you really need to have a passion for the business. If you think about um, everybody that we have employed at Boost, and I'm not just thinking about the people we have today, the people who've been part of our journey, right? They were able to contribute to uh, the success of the company because they were driven primarily by passion. The fact that they were doing something that was making a difference out there and they were doing something that was a first in Malaysia. If you ask people what their motivation was and what they would take back from the time they spent at Boost, I think a lot of people would say that. When I say Boost, I'm not just talking about the e-wallet, I'm talking about our lending business, which was originally Aspirasi and everything, right? So the people who are there today, the people who we've been moved on, I think would, you know, call that out as the first thing. And I think that's, that's super important, right? Especially when you have a lot of people who kind of Join us are people who uh, who are early on in their careers, right? So boost is their first, second, or third, maximum third job. I think that's something that is very, very important. If the passion is not there, it's very, very difficult. The second is, I think, equally important is focus. I think what we've realized over time is uh, it pays to be focused in what you want to do. I think we've uh, we've successfully built models that have worked because we've stayed true to those models and uh, we've tried to make sure that they work and we've been able to scale some. So very often what I find, um, especially people who've been used to working in an, an either in a sandbox environment or you're just in an innovation kind of a department, right? Uh, you tend to launch something, you tend to have a great idea and then you tend to move on to the next one, right? I think it's very important to stay with some of the ideas you have, but make sure that it gets market acceptance validation. And if you look at our, our journey and you look, if you look at some of the successes we've had, I think it's because we've stayed with our customer, we've learned from our customer and we've kind of maintained that focus uh, in terms of what we wanted to do, right? So I think that, that element of focus, staying with your, uh, staying with some of the beliefs that you had are quite important. And I think maybe I should have started with this one, right? But I think it's important to make sure that um, while we often have a vision of where we want to go, right? 
uh, and I think from day one we've had that in our fintech business, as we have in all our other uh, digital businesses as well. I think it's very important that vision relates to each and every person in the startups. As the CEO of the company, I should be if somebody looks me in the eye and asks me, um, if you achieve your vision, how do I achieve my personal ambitions and goals? That's a question we should be able to answer, right? And that that is something that I think every startup or every group of people who want to uh, do something, uh, have a vision for the company, but also have a vision for yourself, have a vision for each and every person in the company. And I think that's that's something that is often overlooked, all right? And that's something, especially if you uh, work in a startup environment and you want to make uh, a success out of that startup, it's very important that you have a vision both for yourself and a vision for everyone in the company.